Welcome to the Beyond Physio Podcast, where we help you move, excel, and inspire others on your journey to your next level with knowledge and advice from experts and testimonials from our like-minded community. Megan, I want to welcome you to the Beyond Physio Podcast. It's so exciting to have you not only on our show, but now you are formerly one of our team members down at our North Carolina office. Yes, thank you so much. It's awesome to be here. Yeah. So let's go into a bit of your background because it's uh, it's very extensive and how you got to where you are professionally as a as a doctor of physical therapy. Let's talk about your gymnastics career first. Yeah, absolutely. So started gymnastics when I was two and a half. My parents put me in the gym because they were tired of me climbing over everything and wanted me to burn some energy. Unfortunately, they had no idea what they were getting themselves into, and I followed it through all the way through college gymnastics. Uh, we tore my ACL when I was 14. So that's what initially started me wanting to go down the PT route, had a really great PT who introduced me to what PT can be in, in sports and wanted to go down that route. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. So tell me about gymnastics. I mean, from the level 10 gyms that we've worked with for many years, I got to say that the, the pain threshold is exceptionally high for athletes like gymnasts, uh, figure skaters, and dancers. Absolutely. 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 Uh, gymnastics is, it's one of the only sports that you peak when you're a minor. And I feel like that's something that takes it different than other sports that we have, um, like soccer, basketball, or football or anything. So we start training 20 hours a week when these kids are in elementary school, which is a lot and it's a lot in the bodies and the sports come a long way in it's strength training and coaching and culture, but still got a long way to go. So we do have a really, really high pain tolerance. Um, and a lot of times there's some pretty traumatic injuries that take kids out for a whole year. And that's what's fun about treating the sport is you get to help to not only starting gymnastics again, but getting to compete again and building up those skills back on all four events. That's tough. What's the uh, worst injury you've seen both as an athlete and maybe as a physio for gymnasts? That's tough. The most common is definitely the stress fracture in the back and it's chronic and unfortunately it happens when these kids start what we call optional gymnastics usually. Um, so they're starting some higher level gymnastics and it's just a lot of extension based activities. They're doing, we like count up and we're like, you're doing 300 backhand swings a day. Like do we really need to do those that many backhand swings to be successful. Um, so I would say that's the most common thing that we see. And then the most traumatic would probably be your ACL or Achilles. Achilles are super common in college, um, not as much in the JO level, but definitely super common in college. And those numbers are just continuing to rise, unfortunately. Now, um, having worked with a gymnast before, like I said, what are some things that your older self now, if you could go back in time, how might you advise parents and maybe even coaches to work with their athletes differently to help preserve some of their longevity in the sport. Yeah, I am someone that understands both sides because I was definitely the kid that wanted to be in the gym 40 hours a week and doing all the reps. And I get it, I do get it. But it's like, what do we really need? Quality over quantity, I think is a big thing for gymnastics in getting these kids through senior year of college. Like it, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many backhand swings and how many series you do at age 16. What matters is how long we can keep you in the sport healthy. And then whenever you stop the sport, whether that be in high school or whether that be when you actually finish college, what does your lifelong athlete self look like after that? Are we having back pain for the next 15 years or are we able to go do sports that we want to do? So I think looking back, it's a lot of strength training and gymnastics is, it's still a culture of, oh, we don't want our kids to touch weights because we don't want them to bulk up. And I feel like we've come a long way. But looking back, it's like coaches, like, let's teach you how to strength train your kids to prevent all of these injuries, to keep them. We want your kids to be able to compete all year long. So I'd say that's a big thing. And then having a break. We're in a culture that, I mean, I was scared to go on vacation as a kid. And my parents still give me a hard time about that. It's like, well, we never went on vacation because you would cry because you wanted to, you didn't want to miss gymnastics. And it's like, looking back, it's like, no, I think, I think it would have been okay. That's funny because, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I was thinking you would actually mention it, that, you know, you figured like gymnasts are pretty strong. Absolutely. And I think the average person out there is thinking, maybe the average parent too is thinking that, well, why would I have my kids strength train if that's what they're getting all day long doing gymnastics? But that's actually not the case. I think, yeah, that's a great point. So what I think of as a physio now is there's gymnastic strength and there is like true strength training. If you look at a typical gym, 
If you look at their strength training, and it's one of the first things that I do when I have a gymnast walk in the door is, what does your strength training look like? It's a lot of push-ups, it's a lot of leg lifts, a lot of pull-ups, a lot of handstands, very gymnastic specific things. And there's not a lot of functional things like a squat, a deadlift, a plank. You would be shocked how many gymnasts cannot do a plank, yet they can hold a handstand for five minutes. So I think it's teaching those foundational strength things to make them better athletes, not just continuing to do gymnastic specific things over and over, but rather building their ability to have strength in all different planes of motion and truly understanding where their body is in space. That's funny. You know, it's funny. I, I first got the wind of just how weak gymnasts were in certain positions when I started yeah. working with them. And my assumptions were to totally challenged. I was thinking, oh, these guys are like super strong and not, and gals too. And when I had them do very simple things, like you said, plank, and that was actually my biggest surprise, it's they true. could not hold the plank for more than some of my older athletes, you know? And they were like struggling, shaking. They couldn't, like they, they're basically the backs were sagging, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So that was a big surprise. And that's what got me into this past where path of thinking that I don't think gymnasts are strong in every way. Right. I think like, and it's, it's a joke of gymnasts are really, really good at what they're good at. And they're really bad at what they don't do. Um, and I think like the fact, like the plank is a perfect example because gymnastics, you need to be able to have that extension based ability, right? To be able to do some of the skills. But then if we don't have the ability to, str to strengthen the core and understand where neutral is, that's where some of these back injuries come in because we don't, they don't understand how to want to answer without that sag in the back and mm -hmm. just continuing this repetitive motion of extension. I see. So the sport specific kinds of moves that they do may not require the kind of stability that you and I would know as physios that they right. actually need. Right. Absolutely. And I think coaches too, like it's, it's not a lack of them wanting to do strength training. I think it's just understanding exactly what to do that's not just gymnastics based things. Yeah. Now let's dive into your published article on yeah. Achilles specific injuries in gymnasts. I was really intrigued by that. Can you talk more about kind of what led you to even consider doing a study like that and what kinds of things you gathered and gained from that experience? Absolutely. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a backstory. I ended in college spastics. Um, one knew I wanted to do PT come from a small town, didn't really know that gymnastics PT even really existed. Um, ended up with not the greatest college experience, ended up with four surgeries in a year and a half. Oh my gosh. Um, graduated early, left college, truly wanting absolutely nothing to do with the sport. Like to be perfectly honest, like, oh, I was frustrated. I wanted out, um, went into PT school. I was like, you know what? Like I want to increase availability of PT to smaller division one schools because that's something that I didn't have and I feel like it would have made a big difference. So when I entered PT school, that was kind of my thought. I was like, I'm gonna do a sports residency. I'm gonna work for a football team. And then something really cool that Duke had was I could do an independent study and I can go back into a gym. And so I got to step back into a gym and they have a like, good, so uh, basically a pro bono service um, for PTs to work with the gymnasts in the local area. Walked back into a gym and immediately was just like, all right, well, I think I was wrong with my life path. Um, so the paper honestly started as a way to give back. I was like, I still don't want to be involved in gymnastics, but if I write this paper, then I've given back to the sport and I can step away and be like, all right, I did my part. So Achilles ruptures are um, skyrocketing in college really? gymnastics. Huh. College gymnasts are 10 times more likely to rupture their Achilles than any other sport, any other college sport. So That's surprising. it definitely needs to be addressed. And it's like, all right, there's, there's two pieces to that. It's like one, why is it happening? And then two, what do we do about it? Once it happens, right? And there's a PT, Dave Tilly up in Boston, who is crazy into gymnastics research and has just done so much for the gymnastics community. And he's really trying to tackle the, why is this happening? Cause let's, that's part of it, right? Um, and so I teamed up with him and a couple other of the gymnastics PTs around the nation. I was like, hey, like, let's, there's absolutely no published protocol of what do we do when this happens for gymnasts? There's so many PTs that don't know gymnastics language. Yeah. Is it hard to treat because it right. sounds like we're speaking a different language, we're saying Yurchenko and Takachev and all of these crazy words. So let's put something out there that helps PTs and athletic trainers and coaches just all be on the same level playing field of Let's get these kids back. We want them to be able to compete again. So that paper went through, he touched a little bit on the why it's happening, but it really dove into 
what do we do when it happens and how do we progress the late stages of this rehab back into the full sport progression. So it truly was my way to give back. And then when writing the paper and everything, I was like, well, yeah, I think this is my new life path. I think gymnastics is where I'm meant to be. I This is my way of having a positive impact on the sport. Yeah, it's funny how we can be so passionate about something for so long, then sort of take a break from it and step away. It's like a, like a lost yeah. love kind of thing, right? Coming back to the old flames, if you will. Absolutely. And so great that you've been contributing this way. And it sounds to me like from our our discussions that this is something, an area that you actually even want to dive into further Absolutely. Uh, as, a, as a physio. Absolutely. It's, gymnastics is a sport where I feel like we deserve PTs that understand our lingo. Um, I mean, I remember when I tore my ACL, I remember showing a video of a tumbling past a surgeon and saying, can I do this? And of course, the answer was always no, but it's like, being able to have the conversations and provide a higher quality of care because I understand the lingo. So that's definitely my next three to five year goal is to make an impact in the triangle and get into those gyms and start creating those relationships with the coaches. Because ultimately my goal is never as a PT to pull your kid from gymnastics. I want to be able to work with you to get your kid competing faster. And okay, maybe there's one or two things that they can't do, but because I understand your lingo, I can give you a whole lot more that you can do. That's great. And because you've actually done the sport and you've been through injuries yourself, like an ACL tear, and obviously you were, you were able to get back to competing again, which is awesome. Um, are there one or two things that you can share from the paper that you wrote um, that might be helpful for parents or for athletes who might be dealing with that late stage um, Achilles tear? Yeah, I think one bit, one of the biggest things is fear of re-injury. Um, and that goes not just for Achilles, that goes for every injury out there. And that's not just gymnastics, that's all of it. But something that I really tried to hone in on with the paper was if we can build what I like to call the insurance policy during the strength training process, the better insurance you've got, the better protected you are. If we can build you up during the boring quote unquote part of PT, you're going to be way better off down the road and you can trust that Achilles, you can trust that ACL or whatever it may be that, hey, I've done everything that I need to do along the way so that I know when I go to do this toe pass, I am safe. I've got this. And then the other thing that I really tried to talk about was, and it goes back to something that I struggled with of, oh, more is not always better. Mm. We wrote out a big giant block, basically, um, a tumbling progression. And it was, hey, like, one block does not necessarily equal one week. It's going to be different for every gymnast. And it's going to be, and it's going to go back and forth throughout the process and to so just embrace it, embrace that process. Because if we embrace the process of, Hey, this is, this is a journey, then we're going to have a higher result in the end. And that's a tough thing to understand as an athlete of like, no, I just, I, I want it now. If I can do a layout, then I can do a double back. It's the same takeoff. You know, it's funny because as you know, very well, uh, that is a common theme among our lifelong everyday athletes, Absolutely. our runners here, where it's, you know. Sometimes the danger is you you give someone an inch, uh, say, oh, you can go back and run X, and they take it to the nth degree, say, it is hard, yeah. I get it, like, we were all that person, but it's now, like, from a different perspective of, of a PT, it's sort of like, let's embrace it. Yeah. Because I want you to be able to do gymnastics when you're 23. I don't want you to have to stop when you're 17. Yeah, let's think. Now, let's transition over into your new other found love, which is in running. Absolutely. And one of the things that I really appreciate about you is that because we see a lot of runners here as well, that this is a part of your new DNA, if you will. Um, tell us how you got into the running journey. Yeah. Um, stress relief, to be yes. honest, honest with you. And I feel like that's a tough thing for gymnasts. It's like, what next? Um, when people transition out of gymnastics or dance or figure skating or whatever the sport may be swimming if they've done it their whole life and it's their identity it's a really hard thing of like what do I do now um and I feel like I was lucky in that I actually found running before I swapped gymnastics as a complete stress relief from college yeah and so it was always a thing of I'm gonna run a marathon and then I'm just to say I did and then I'm never gonna run again here I am <laughs> uh, but true stress relief and now it's it's a game and I yeah. think that's the fun part about running is that you're truly really competing against yourself. There's always more, there's always better, there's always faster. And it's like, how can I optimize myself to do that? And it doesn't necessarily mean, oh, I have to run more miles this week than I ran last week. It's optimizing the little things too. Now, Megan, uh, having worked with uh, a good number of runners yourself, 
What are like a couple things that you have found uh, maybe in faulty running mechanics that our runners could actually benefit from? Yeah, my biggest thing with my runners is multi-directional strength. Running is very sagittal. It's very straightforward. We don't really deviate to the side, right? But we have so many muscles and our bones and our joints are meant to move in different angles and different motions. So we have to strengthen those, especially for the trail runners. It's like, you're never going to hit the trail at this perfect little angle. I wish that you would, but you're not. So let's train in those different angles. Um, we see all the time, the knees caving in, the very narrow base of support. It's like, let's widen that base of support, teach you how to rotate a little bit, strengthen those rotator muscles, and your running's going to get better. And then you're also going to have less injuries. I like that. You know, it's funny, and I echo that because I would say most of our runners do lack in that rotational, multi-directional stability and strength. And once we start to get them on a program that incorporates that, oftentimes their issues they've, came, they've come in with have well, have improved and they've gotten faster, faster. Like, without even trying. They're like, how do they get faster? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like to say that, you know, we, we do solve complex injuries in runners, but the solutions that we have are typically very simple. And it's, it's about pointing out the fundamentals that can improve with time. A little bit of coaching from a physio, a little bit of programming from a coach, and that can make all the difference for the longevity in the sport of running. Absolutely, and that's what I appreciate. Like coming from my perspective too, of like, I didn't run my whole life. I didn't do cross country when I entered college. I didn't think I'd ever run more than two miles. I didn't ever need it for my sport. Um, so I think it's really fun to teach new runners the importance of strength training because we don't. A lot of them don't know, um, and then they get hurt, and it's kind of like this awakening moment for them and it's fun to see them get excited of like oh so if i do this thing 20 minutes a week then i can do this it's like ah exactly. awesome it's so it's so rewarding i know in my heart of hearts i wish we could see all new runners before they start mm-hmm. running because the question we always ask our runners is who taught you how to run exactly right? and since uh everyone says well i did uh, typically, yes, we all run differently but there are principles that if we apply to running styles of all kinds we can still get some great benefit from that and hopefully become injury resistant and maybe even resilient from an injury, recover faster so that we're not sidelined for weeks or months, which a lot of our runners tend to be because they either overdo it with the wrong form um, or their technique is off, like I said, or they're just not strong enough um, or they're just doing things just kind of a wonky way that makes them more susceptible to injury. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've always said that the hardest part of a race is getting to the start line. It's not getting to the finish line. It's getting to the start line healthy. And I love here that we have this comprehensive way of helping runners understand like what it truly takes to get to a start line and doesn't necessarily mean increasing everything that you're doing. It's sometimes it's doing less, but doing it more effectively. Yes. And I'm so glad you said that it's, uh, and I think applies to everything we talked about, which is less is more. For sure. Um, have you found also, because we do a lot of outdoor analyses for a gait, just because I have found personally that the treadmill mill tends to limit our gait a little bit and people who don't run the treadmill normally, they, when they, change yeah, they change everything. So then when they're on there, they look kind of wonky and maybe their PT at that moment is saying, well, well, you're, here's why your running's off. But then you take them outside and they run completely differently. Absolutely. Absolutely. And another thing that I love to do is, all right, let's look at it at the beginning and then let's do a bunch of strength training and make you tired. Now let's look at it once you're tired. We don't have runners that come in and say, oh, I'm having pain at mile at half a mile. No, it's I'm having pain at mile 12, 15 or whatever it is. So let's look at how are things changing as we get tired, because that's where we're going to make our impact is truly understanding the whole picture, not just one little aspect of our patients. I love that. And it's funny because I'm so glad you mentioned that too, because I've had many of our ultra runners who sometimes they don't have issues after 20 miles. Right. right? So I'll have them come in after they run their 20 miles and then tell me where it hurts. And let's t- look at their form, like you said, after they've done something to see where the deviations are, because maybe they're really good at compensating up until a certain volume of running, and after that, things fall apart. Absolutely. And then just creating whatever we see at that point, creating that foundation to then make them more resilient to be able to get to mile, whatever that mile goal is. And that's what I've always said. Like, people are like, why Why do you want to run 100 miles? It's like, whatever my patient's goal is, if it's to go around 250 miles, like, I'm on your team. I'm going to do everything in my power to get you to the start line and get give you the tools to be able to get to the finish line. And that's frequently something we hear from runners who've tried traditional PT. They tried maybe some uh, YouTube exercises and they're not getting the results they're looking for. They're, they've been told by their PT and maybe the traditional medical system that, well, if it hurts, to just stop. 
So there are no other options. You have these very skilled runners, high level runners who now have no identity because they've actually been a runner their whole life. And now finally they found us thankfully, and we're able to provide them with some options to get back on the track to getting to where they want to look to what they love to do again. And it's really sad that there are so many athletes out there of all kinds of all ages that are still wondering what they can do, fall to depression, go down downward spiral, leading to, you know, very bad things sometimes. But all they had to do was find somebody who could really listen and take a different look at what's going on to see if there might be something else going on. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that you mentioned that too, because it goes back to even like my passion with gymnastics of something I want to do for every patient, but especially patients that one are starting running or are maybe in that pediatric realm or college realm is learning how to be your own advocate. Whether, you know, like you might move states and like, I want to give you the tools to be able to go find a great PT, to be able to go find a great doctor to understand, hey, this is what I need and this is how I'm going to advocate for what I need to go to get the results that I want. That's awesome. And Megan, uh, for any runners out there who might be sort of suffering from chronic injuries or maybe they haven't gotten their issues solved yet, what are some things that you might recommend that they do uh, before they come find a place like us? Yeah, one is to come find a place like us, but two, go find a running group. You would be so amazed at the amount of just like community that they have and to see advice. Hearing from other people, I think is a big thing. Running can be pretty lonely at times and I think finding a community is huge. Um, ask, where do you guys strength train? Like find that community, ask around. I Also, I think it's a really huge to look into nutrition and that goes both realms. I know that runners often struggle with body image and everything with nutrition, but I think go to a nutritionist. You know, like what, what other things other than maybe PT can I adjust to make running a little bit easier? Megan, thanks so much for coming on our show. And I'm really looking forward to working with you. Um, actually, we are working together right now. So I'm <laughs> looking yeah. seeing where this, where this takes us both in running and gymnastics, because I feel like um, having skills in both areas uh, really helps to further set us apart from the average PT place down the street. Absolutely. I'm super excited to be full time now and things are Things are looking great. I'm excited to be on board. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks so much for tuning into today's episode. It really does mean a lot to us. And don't forget to like, share, subscribe, or comment if you got at least one or two helpful insights or takeaways to help you get to your next level.